This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. It is my pleasure to welcome Todd Duncan to the show. He's from my old hometown in Newport Beach. He is the world's number one authority on trust and sales mastery. And we're going to talk about productivity and mindset and all sorts of great stuff today, which is really many of the foundational tools for success. So it's a pleasure to have him on. Todd, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, Jason, I'm doing great today. Thanks for the honor of being with you and uh, looking forward to our, uh, our, our dialogue. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. And you know, your book, High Trust Selling, has got fantastic reviews online. And I definitely want to get to that. But before we get to that, because, you know, some people may not realize that we are all in the sales business. <laughs> <I'm> probably, <yeah. laughs> because we're always trying to sell an idea. Maybe it's to our significant other. Maybe it's to kids whatever, right? We're all selling something, right? And the foundation of success there is obviously trust. So let's maybe start with the subject of trust and how it's created or how it's ruined, wherever you want to go on that. Sure. So one of the things that we talk about to people, you know, just in, in the normalcy of conversation is that if you don't connect, you can't convert. And it doesn't matter, again, the idea that you're trying to promote to a, a boss, to a person on your team, to a client, to, as you said, family members, you know, it doesn't really matter um, what you're trying to do if you haven't connected. And the bigger the idea of what you're trying to do, the more important connection is. And so Gallup tells us that, you know, if we are in business, or if we have you know, some kind of type, of type of our comp that's tied to relationship productivity, that we can improve gross margin by 26%. We can improve productivity by 85%. And when we don't have connection, then what happens is trust leaks out and tension comes in. And when tension is in and trust is out, nobody wants to hear our idea. And yet what we end up doing is we continue to promote the idea, forgetting that if we're not connected, there's not going to be a high degree of interest there anyway. So those two things are always happening. There's a, a level of high trust. And if we have high trust, um, we have to then by counteractive measure have low tension and that'll happen naturally. And yet the higher the tension, the lower the trust. And so what the goal is in any conversation is what we call conversational productivity, which is ask questions you've never asked so you can learn things you've never learned so you can help people in ways you've never helped them. And then all of a sudden trust flourishes. And, you know, it's so beautiful when there's no game being played. There's so It's so beautiful when we understand that in the midst of massive digital transformation in the world that people in 27 out of the top 30 countries surveyed still value humanity first, technology second. And so how do you have high trust? How do you use high tech to support the relationship and how do you do it the right way? So people say, yes, you have emotional connection and people are open to your ideas. And, you know, I tell people real quickly that, you know, trust is the hardest thing to gain. It's the easiest to lose. And it's the most important to hold on to. And if you have trust, you have everything. It's, a, it's your superpower. It's the, uh, the biggest, most profitable currency in, in business. And without it, you have nothing. Yeah. What you just mentioned, you know, that's that's not a very fair equation in life, is it? You know, it takes a lifetime to build trust yep. and a minute to lose it. <laughs> it's that. So, it takes seconds. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. right. And so that's why it's got to be revered. And, you know, what we're seeing everywhere, Jason, is that people thrive on trust. And the bigger the financial decision, the bigger the purchase, you know, whatever it is, the bigger trust is necessary. I mean, if I'm buying a candy bar, you know, I don't trust, I don't need to trust the store. I just trust the brand and I'm not right. a big candy bar guy, but if I'm buying a, yep. 
a manufacturing business that makes candy bars, you know, I've got to have a different relationship. And this connection, you know, human, human, it's super important in today's world, even in the modern world in which we live, that's got a lot of trust issues, I might say, without getting- Oh, no question about it. Uh, <laughs> lot, lot of issues. Yeah. So give us an example of some of these questions that you mentioned. Well, when it's, you said, it's like, ask um, questions you never ask. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. We we do a lot of work in in lending and real estate, and uh, we had a uh, we had a sixty day kind of research project we were doing, and we had spoken to two hundred real estate professionals and and lending professionals, and we said over the next sixty days we want you to go from asking whatever number of questions you normally ask to establish trust to seeing if you can take it all the way down to one one question, and we're going to come back together sixty days from now, and we're going to see if you could get somebody to say yes with only one question. And everybody loves this because, you know, if it normally takes an hour to establish trust, would it be okay if it only took five minutes? And the answer has got to be yes, right? So this one guy gets on and he goes, I can't believe this. My whole career, 20 years, I've been asking way too many questions that have zero meaning to the depth of the conversation. He said, I have something to share. I was meeting with a, uh, a, a wife and her husband, and they were moving from Anchorage, Alaska to Portland, Oregon, and they needed home financing for a home that they were going to buy in Portland. And so when I got connected with them, um, I said this, as we begin to build this relationship, what would it mean to you to own a home? That was the question. And as he tells the story, the wife began crying in about five seconds and the husband followed in about 20 seconds. And as he asked what's behind the tears, here's what they said. If they could get a home, they would be the first couple in the entire lineage of their family, like not in a generation or mm -hmm. two generations forever to own a home. And that's all it was about. And so immediately what Tim said is he said, if I can help you accomplish that goal, are you ready to move forward? And they said, mm -hmm. yes. So the whole thing, that, that whole thing took three or four minutes. They got straight down to business. 30 days later, the loan funded, they own a home and it was just magical. And he said, this has changed my life because I created trust in five minutes by asking 90% less questions. Mm -hmm. And that's an example. If I, okay. if I'm a coach or if I have like people on my team, you know, one of the great questions is either a present question or a future question. A present question is, Hey, Jason, based on where you're at right now, what are two or three of the concerns you have about, and just fill it in. And how could I come alongside you and help you with that? That's one question, you know, and if you want to build trust, it's tell me what you're concerned about and let me help. Or future, you know, the, the world's changing, Jason. Um, you got a good following. Where do you want to be in three years? And what are two or three of the things that are top of your list that you got you to gotta figure out to help you get there? And how could I maybe come alongside you and give you some advice? Yeah. Simple, you know, simple questions. And, you know, one great question can, can, can launch five to 10 minutes of, of intel from your client. That's just, it's, it's magic. It's just magic. There is no question about that. <laughs> Pardon the pun. It, it amazes me, Todd, and I'm sure it amazes you how when you reach out to a vendor or talk to a salesperson, they just talk. And it's like you finish that whole interaction and think they know nothing about me. Yeah, it, it's, it's just shocking. How can you sell something to someone if you don't know anything about them? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it and it's so it's so apparent, right? Just in the in the dialogue. But the research tells us that the, and, and let's let's just park sales here for just a second and let's talk about like, you know, husband and wife or or business partners. Let's talk about all of that together. And here's what we know. The more you talk, the more disengaged the person you're talking to is. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a relationship, um, what we know for sure is the more you talk, the less likely you are to have emotional connection. If I'm in selling, the more I talk, the more likely I am to lose the influence or the order or the business or the purchase. And, you know, and you sit here and you go, why do people talk them out of the sale, talk themselves out of the sale? Well, they don't even know they're doing it. And so one of the research things is we take a hundred words and we measure um, in a prospecting environment, how many people say yes to a hundred word pitch. And then we say, take it down to 80 words. 
and we start to measure conversion. And if we can take the 100 down to 80, we get conversion of about 17%. And then we take it down to 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20. If we get all the way down to use 20 words instead of 100, the conversion is 71%. So, you know, a question that might be five to 10 words long could set the hook to have your wife understand that you really care or you know when you say honey tell me more or you look at your business partner and and you say tell me why that's important to you so i really understand where your motive motivation is coming from those are game changing i got a 25 and 24 year old son uh, i can't talk to them i gotta ask questions and when i ask questions i go dad that's interesting that's an interesting question so the world the world is full listen to this this is great the world is full of too much promotion and not enough emotion period yeah, well, people might agree with what you just said, and I agree with it, but the marketer, if you will, mm -hmm. will say, well, Todd, that emotion isn't scalable, right? You know, that requires one-on-one -on -one interaction, and I only have, you know, eight hours a day that I want to work, right? So how do you answer that? Well, it's super simple. So, okay, so if you only have eight hours a day that you want to work and you think it's a one-to-one -one connection, do you want to use eight hours to have eight conversations or do you want to get so good that you can have 32 conversations in the same day? You want to talk about scale and productivity. I've got a, uh, um, I got a lifeline. We teach a proprietary kind of um, business advantage system that's called the circle of cash flow. And what the circle of cash flow in, in essence says is if you and I are deeply connected, you will be an advocate for my brand. So the reason why, if I only have one client that I want to have this kind of conversation is because that's going to be the fastest and most effective way for me to prospect, to get referrals. And those are high trust referrals. So they convert faster and they stay longer and they, they spend more. I've got one guy I met in 1996. He's still one of my best friends today. And from the time I met him until today, we've made $32 million in business, not just from him, but from about 37 different business owners in Australia that he has linked us up with. So why would I not have an emotional conversation with John? And why would I not follow up with him on his birthday every year and tell him I love him and, you know, I'm wishing him another great year. And why wouldn't I stay in touch and send him an anniversary card for the first year he hired me to go to Australia to help him out? Why wouldn't I do all that? Because if I do that, he spreads my name. And so the reason why I want high advocacy, which requires high trust, is because then the cost of building a business goes way down. And there's a book out called Marketing Rebellion by Mark Schaefer. That book absolutely slays auto marketing, the, the, what businesses think about, how they're connecting, what clients are actually thinking. There's such a chasm between what we market and the impact it makes, and it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So the digital noise- We're, we're just over-marketed. I mean- Right. We are oh, total 100% yeah. over-marketed. Yeah. And, we, and we're over-marketed with promotion, not emotion. And so, yeah. you know, I don't need to market if I have emotional connection with you because you'll be an advocate for me. And this, this group of elite guys that we, guys and gals, 72% of their business is not new business from new people. 72% of the business is referral and repeat business from clients they've already served and helped in the businesses that they help and serve. And I just think, you know, here, here's something I want to give to everybody. If you, if you have anything to do in business, you can either choose transactions or you can choose relationships. And my first mentor said, transactions will make you a living, relationships will make you a fortune. And you know what, I, I have a corollary to that with real estate investing. Yeah. And I've always said the people who are flippers, who, who buy and fix and flip, they have spending money and it's, it's great, you know, but the people who buy and hold have real wealth. Yeah. And it's the same concept right there, right? You know, the relationship is the buy and hold mentality or the value investor mentality, maybe. And the fix and flip is the transactional mentality, right? Let's just make as much money as we can on this deal and move on, right? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And and there's not, a, there's not a lot of emotion. It's all, you know, optics and numbers. And yet they rely on the open house and they rely on the first impressions. And they, they've got that little window from the time they go live to the time they sell to they get till they get their next block of money to go do another deal. They're in the deal business. They're not okay. in the relationship business. And you're right. It's a good analogy. Right. So the other metaphor maybe I'd want to throw out there, and, and you can comment on this, of course, is it's the difference between going deep and going wide. 
And I always said when I used to train salespeople, I, I said, I'd rather be number one with a small group than number two with a large group because there is no number two in sales. You're, you're, you either get the business or you don't, or, you know, or your competitor gets it, right? And so you've got to be the number one candidate for them. It's just number two doesn't matter, right? And so I think a lot of people are just, they spread themselves too thin 100%. over and, and try to, they try to like grab all the marbles, right? When you should just focus on a smaller number. People can become extremely wealthy it depends on the business, of course, and every business model is different, obviously, but you know, you can make an awful lot of money with 500 or a thousand good customers, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. And you know, we have a, we have a law in the high trust selling is called the law of the bullseye and the law of the bullseye says, if you don't choose the best relationships, you're likely to do business with all the worst relationships. And what it is, it's a metaphor for going deep and people need to know what that really means. I'm more interested in client share. How many pieces of business can I get from one client who I've befriended, who loves me and trusts me versus how many can I get from a whole bunch of clients? And I tell people all the time, I'd rather have 10 referrals from one relationship than 10 relationships with one referral each. And one of the laws in the book is called the law of the scale, make more money, have fewer clients. And it's right to your point, right? That if I've got a bank and the bank has one president who directs vendor services, and I can be a lender in that bank for 4,000 depositors, I got one relationship with 4,000 potential referrals. But if I don't pay attention to that and I've got to go market to get 4,000 referrals, it's a joke. And so people need to understand this, that, that you know, we, we tell people, Jason, if you, do, if you want your clients for life, you have to talk to them during their life. And we usually are a one and done society. And market share is a really hard thing to chase if you don't have deep pockets. But client share is easy. All you got to do is fall in love with your clients, demonstrate your love on a regular basis, and you can run a financial model. We tell lenders, if you have 400 loyal borrowers and you've got 10 to 15 you know, builders or, or real estate agents, you can make $7 million every three to four years in revenue and not have any of that be new business except for the referrals that are new referrals. And it's right. like, wow. And one of the worst things that can happen to any business or really industry actually is to become commoditized. Exactly. And, and so when you become commoditized, you have no pricing power uh, because there's no relationship. It's just shopping, shopping, shopping. So, and of course in the lender business, that's an extreme problem for lenders. That that's for sure. Talk to us more about productivity. There is so much coming at everybody nowadays. The world is just overwhelming. <laughs> How can we be more productive when we, we get up that day, you know, maybe we get up early, we want to seize the day and, and make the most of it. And it, sometimes the day seizes you. Right. Uh, so what are your best productivity tips? Well, I, I think the day does seize us. And I think we, we laugh at it. You know, I ask people all the time by a show of hands when I'm in a live presentation, how many of you have had a game plan for the day? And like by 930 in the morning, it's already hosed and everybody yeah. laughs and then raises their hand and says, yep. And so what, what we know absolutely about productivity is that if you don't control the events you're involved in, um, then you will become a slave to the hours that the day serves up. And if you do control what events and activities you're involved in, then you can control the outcome of that day. And what we find out is if we take the proverbial 80-20 rule and we just chunk that down and deepen and deepen and deepen it, we get down to the, the point where most successful business people, whether they're on a line, employees, on a team, leadership, sales, it doesn't matter what we're in. What matters is that the most productive people in the world get more done by focusing on fewer things that matter more and produce a different ROI. And so like if, if we're in, you know, selling and we have to have conversation with potential prospects um, and I know that that's an important piece of my business and only 5% of the day is prospecting because I got 95% of the day managing orders and managing people and this, that, and the other thing, I'm going to lose my productivity. But if I prospect from eight to 10 and I get that done, then I'm creating compound effect. I'm creating like today I'm going to do that. And then tomorrow I'm going to do it. And then the benefit of the next day is I'm going to have the benefit of three days ago and two days ago. So 
in the in high trust selling, we we have two laws: the law of the broom, which says to take your business up, clean it up. So that is what are the non essentials, like even email. Like if you're on demand with email, you are multitasking in the most debilitating way possible. And what we know about multitasking is a, it's not even really possible. It's called cognitive conflict, and your brain can only do one thing at a time unless you're working out and listening to music. Okay, you can do both of those at the same time or or a podcast, but you can't you can't work on the Johnsons and then work on the Smiths or you can't coach this employee and simultaneously deal with this employee. You, you have to be focused. And what ends up happening is if I can get rid of multitasking and I can get into what we call single tasking. And then I can take back control by blocking email. Like, like I'm going to, you know, if, if it's me and I'm a, I'm a business owner, you know, I might check email at nine and I might check email at four. And in between then my team is going to check email. I don't have time to get into email. I have to lead a company and lead vision and those types of things. And ideally it's like, how often do you get an email from your doctor, you know, or how often does the actual attorney email you versus somebody on his or her team? And we end up just kind of rethinking about what, what are the myths and lies that we have fallen prey to that are robbing us from our life force? I mean, we're giving this thing called life to, you know, to yeah. a job. And if it is robbing us of joy because the day is just stressed out and we go home, then by definition are off the job life is as big of a mess as our on the job business yep. or life. So we gotta, you know, you gotta take things away to build things up. And we only have so many hours in the day. And so we tell people, you know, every day, what would happen if you could get just another 30 minutes of let's do one or two things that really matter. And let's see what happens to the other things that we tend to focus on. And then completely on the side, if we don't have great skill sets. If we don't have mastery of the, the core skill sets, we end up being busy. And Jason, mm -hmm. nobody gets a paycheck for being busy. No yeah. company gets like Fortune 500, you know, top company or Inc. 500. Nobody gets that because you got a busy team. And we got to redefine busy. We got to move from busy to focus. We got to put a cone of silence on when we have to focus. And we can't flip back and forth because then we double, triple the amount of time it takes to get most stuff done. So yeah, well, I, you know, I, it's, you're reminding me of one of my favorites, the late Stephen Covey. It's mm -hmm. the vital versus urgent. And what's vital, if you are responsible for growing a business, business development, sales, whatever, is it's vital that you are reaching out and touching your client base, your customers, your audience, or prospecting for more of them. You know, if, if you're in that stage, it depends where you are, obviously. And then you solve the urgency problem in a lot of ways, because yeah. if the money comes <clears throat> in, you have the ability to set up the infrastructure. Well, and it's, it's a very small window between the yep. time that you decide I want to build the infrastructure and how much money it's going to take. And we tell people that um, there's this idea of the 90 day burn and you can actually reinvent your entire business productivity in 90 days by looking at, you know, one or two part time people and then one or two full time people and then and building team. Stephen Covey was a friend of mine. And, and when yep. he endorsed time traps, he said time time uh, traps can be a harsh task master, but it will give you the freedom you seek if you get rid of the traps you're mm -hmm. in. And I just, I love that because, you know, him and Hiram Smith were two of my good buds and I yep. love Franklin Covey. Franklin Covey yeah. did. Yeah. It was just unbelievable. And that's how I live my life. I get, I get more done in a couple hours and the other, you know, six or seven hours can be like, I can lead the team. I can do this. I can do that. But I make five calls a day to five CEOs and I make 4,132 birthday calls a year to key mm -hmm. clients just to say happy birthday. I do videos or text or on some of them I'll actually call. So you just got to, some of the simple stuff that keeps human connection strong is if I'm not in touch, I'm out of touch. Right, right. You dropped the hint there. That is the title of one of your books, Time yes. Traps. Tell us what some of the time traps are. You know, you have chasing the wind, the identity trap, the organization trap, the yes trap, the control trap, the technology <laughs> trap. That's a big one, I think, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So tell us about some of those. Pick a couple of your favorites, maybe. Yeah, well, I love I love uh, chasing the wind because that's how the book starts off. And and I think we we chase the wind because we never we can never tame the wind. And And when you're chasing the wind, in business, you're just trying to get everything done, right? And the book makes it very clear 
from the get-go that the most productive people in the world have gotten rid of the notion that I can do it all, right? And so you have to own that. The identity trap is having your success wrapped up in only what you do versus who you're becoming. And so we really begin to talk about, do you really want to, you know, do you really want to work 40 years or do you want your identity to be one that you do it so well in 10 that you can mentor others and build other businesses for the next 30? The law of the hourglass says that you, you, you have to make your best moves before your time runs out. And the best moves would be, what are you most gifted at? What produces the best revenue? And then how many times do you repeat that during the day? Because if you don't do that, then the minutes are being used for something that's less productive. I love the um, I, I, I love the organizational trap, you know, juggling, which is the multitasking, unnecessary tasks. It's like, I don't check email except for two times a day and I'm off of it in five minutes. Why? Because I'm not going to juggle that. There, there's a couple hundred emails that come into me every day. I'm, I can't answer them all. So my team takes care of that. The failure trap, big deal, failure trap. People need to understand that failure is a good thing. It's like hot and cold, loud and soft. Off, you know, fast and slow success and failure. It's not a trap unless you stay in it. And I did an Instagram post the other day. It's not the mistakes we make, but how the mistakes make us. You know, it's really powerful to understand failure is okay. It's, it's actually very exciting when you realize that I can fail and not repeat that. And then I get time freedom because the biggest, you know, the biggest like myth, keep making calls. Well, if I suck at making calls and somebody's telling me to keep making calls, I'm going to keep failing making calls. If I'm your leader, I don't want to make you do something that makes you feel less than. I want to help you do something well so you feel more than and you feel confident, you feel excited. So that's a, you know, that's a that's a big deal. Um, and I think the party trap, you know, the party trap is is celebrating success in ways that are detrimental and and unhealthy to our our bodies and and whatnot. And um, there's nothing wrong with celebration, but what I'm learning more and more about productivity, Jason, as I study it and and even influence is that mental wellness and and mental health and you know, uh, disease and and getting the body fine tuned and, you know, don't putting, th don't put things into the body that are toxic, you know, really, really take, take advantage of this machine, which can be your Ferrari for the rest of your life. You know, we got challenges with obesity and, and addiction and, and oh, suicide yeah. and all this stuff. And I had a, I had a, uh, I had a story. I'll just tell you this real quick. I was on an interview in Australia and, um, about a year and a half ago, a guy's business was collapsing financially. Uh, he went up to one of the tallest buildings in Sydney to commit suicide. He jumped off and on the fifth floor hit the canopy. On the fourth floor hit the next canopy. On the third floor hit the next canopy. And by the time he got down to the cement, he was dangling off the first canopy and didn't even hit the ground. And he that guy can't reach a goal. <laughs> it's just like, right? But but for him, it was like, okay. Yeah. I got more to do, I guess. Yeah. So for some reason, I, I yeah. failed at taking my own life. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. good about that? <laughs> Great. Yeah. I get a second chance. I don't think so. So, so did he turn his life around? And he did. He did. I, I'm he guessing that's a, a good mental, story, right? He started a mental health clinic for business entrepreneurs that were mm -hmm. suffering with financial struggles. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I've, I've had two friends that have taken their lives because the financial thing got upside down and, yep life shouldn't be about that. If we're centered and we understand what we're trying to do and we have, you know, healing confidence in our life because we've got good mentors and we're making progress and we make better choices and different decisions. I mean, why would we want to snuff it out? It's going to, it's going to get snuffed out early enough anyway. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think a lot of that, and I'm certainly no psychologist, but you know, I, I like studying the human condition a lot. A lot of that is this false goal, a false expectation. You know, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that are just looking to be happy. Right. And I don't know if happiness is a proper goal. And here's what I mean by that. I think, I think the, the point of life is to make a contribution to be of service. And I think the happiness comes through that, right? Is, you know, being, being useful, contributing, doing something that's meaningful, meaningful work, you know, it's a, it's a big part of our life. It's more than a third of our life yeah. for sure. And it's something that even when we're not working, we're thinking about that, you know, and it's important.
You know, it's not just about money. It's a mission. And I think a lot more fulfillment and, and happiness can come through that than this idea of being hedonistic and, oh, you know, I got to be happy, right? Like, what, what, is, what does that even mean? I, I don't know. It's, no. am, I, am I off on that or am I on target? No, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we have the, the ability and we have the God-given right and skill to choose mindset. And we're told not to worry and we're told not to fear. And yet there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of worry. And if you fixate on that, then you're not going to come up with the solutions to whatever your potential issue is right now. And, and what we know is that you choose gratitude. You can find gratitude in everything. Um, you can find the good in anything that is bad. Um, you can make decisions where you have control and you can give up control where you have no control and have a peaceful, you know, different kind of journey. And I believe that you can be happy, but I believe you have to choose that attitude. And what it does is it reverses the drag on why people are not happy. My, uh, my grandmother gave me a book uh, early in my life. It was called Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. And it was written by W. Clement Stone. And yep, I Hill. remember that book. That's an oldie. <laughs> yeah, it's a really oldie. And, and what, the one thing I remember from that book that I, I tell people is they go on to say that there's very little difference between successful people and unsuccessful people. But the little difference makes the biggest difference. The little difference is attitude and the big difference is whether it's positive or not and i think we can choose positivity and i think when you orient your mind around goodness and gratitude and joy and the fact that you get another day and you get to breathe and you get to you get to con continue to develop this canvas called you happiness is the byproduct and people think that there's some panacea to happiness that at some point later in life i'm going to be happy i believe you choose happiness today and i believe if you go through the day looking for happiness you'll have more of it and certainly when you're doing well and you and you feel productive and you feel that you're making an impact and and making a difference you know you have emotional happiness i mean there's financial happiness i think that people uh have a hard time finding happiness when they're stressed financially and you know it's hard and uh and yet i think a lot of people that don't have their values clear that have a lot of money aren't happy either you know right. I think you got to have your values clear and be all about that but man Jason, we choose so much of what we believe. And it's so funny when you just choose positivity, you move through the day and you attract positivity. Well, and, and maybe part, a big part of that is just when you, when you talk about values and so forth, you know, it's understanding <clears throat> what does success mean to a particular person, right? And a lot of people have this success, oh, I've got to be happy, or I've got to make a, you know, $10 million a year or whatever it is, right? And it's like these funny goals that aren't really like the right goals, you know? And I know anybody could say, well, that's my goal. Okay. That's just your opinion. But I, I'm not sure that's true. I think it might be empirical because if the goal and the value is, for example, to be useful, to provide a contribution, right? Mm -hmm. If you go broke tomorrow, you can start out the next day after you go broke and be useful and make a contribution again. You, you can never lose. Like there is no failure there, right? As long as you just do things that are contributing. Yeah. Right? But people, I don't know, they, they just hang their hat on all these sort of, I'll, maybe I'll say it this way, false gods. You yeah. know, and it's it's just more in tune with what the process is than the result. The result is simply a byproduct and it'll it'll usually come out of the right process. Right. Yeah. And that gets back to the identity trap. And uh, if, if you're waiting for outside something to validate your inside, whatever, you're going to be chasing it for the rest of your life. And, you know, I, um, I had a period in my life where I decided I was 46. I, I was pretty much retired and um, I decided I wasn't done yet and I wanted to really make a bigger impact in the world. And so one of the ways that I thought I could do that is I could buy a big company. And so I, I, uh, I bought John Maxwell's leadership company. He and I were friends and I helped oh, him. Oh yeah, Maxwell's great. Yeah. 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 And he and I were great friends and, and I bought his company, but I'm not a mergers and acquisition guy, but I had the right heart, you know, for every leader, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of followers and maybe this thing would work out. And, you know, I made two mistakes as a CEO and, and I take full responsibility. One was I let the CEO of our smaller company manage the whole thing. And that was a mistake. He's a good guy, but he couldn't manage at scale. And the other thing is I overdelegated the checkbook and, you know, I, I had some, some big misfires there. And so I, all 
all that to say is it led to nine years of trying to sell the company and then trying to restart my other company and then selling that company and having that company change the deal. And it was nine years of absolute hell. But through the whole thing, through the whole thing, I knew that my purpose hadn't changed and my purpose was to make a difference. And I started to see as much as I would like to have avoided nine years of financial stress. And that was culminated by my my wife dying from breast cancer at the end of that after a 25 year marriage. I look at that and I go, because of that nine year run of challenge and hurt and pain and staying upright and keeping going. And Darren Hardy talks about this story all the time when he references the reason why I made it through is I never wavered from my purpose. And my purpose was not about money. My purpose was to make a difference. And I started seeing that what I was really afraid to share was as a success coach, I had failed and I had failed huge, huge, big, really, really big. But as soon as I started sharing that, and when Darren Hardy said, can I interview on this? As soon as I shared my story, millions of CEOs and business owners listened to an interview about my journey and it changed their life and it changed their direction. And hardship produces greatness. If you have the right attitude, tough times never last, tough people do. That's yeah. mindset, right? And my journey since then is better, bigger, wealthier, healthier, and even more satisfying and fulfilling. And I have a whole different spirit about me. But nine years of my life was in a struggle of yeah. deep, deep proportions. But we can get through anything if we have the right mindset. I know the feeling. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, and I love I love that title of uh, Robert Schuler's book, Tough Times Never Last, Tough People Do. Yeah. It's great. I grew up in his church. Yeah, in the Crystal Cathedral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk yeah. about vision. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, he he was he was an amazing man, definitely. Yeah. And it's interesting because if people really just look at it from the point of they can't lose, right. and and see like your failure stories, you failed well, daring greatly, as the saying yeah. goes, right? And that's yeah. cool, you know, that you did that. But some would look and say, "Oh, see, he failed," right? stupid, stupid way to look at it, right? <laughs> but if if your thing is, you know, remember during the Great Recession, when that really when that shit hit the fan back 13, 14 years ago, yeah. 13 years ago, and that billionaire committed suicide, right? Because he didn't have 2 billion, or, or whatever, right? Like, that's just amazing that someone would do that, right? That That's just, it's the wrong goalpost. And yeah. if the goalpost is like, look, if I lose, if I'm in this, you know, say, say you're on the verge of going under with your company, or you're, you know, in a lawsuit, and you know, the lawsuit could bankrupt you, like, so what, just do something else. And if you have the mindset that you cannot lose, okay, say I lose everything. And I got to go buy a trailer and a cheap car and drive it around the country. That might actually be a better life. Yeah. Okay. You might discover all kinds of things about yourself and your next mission and your next big thing. Like literally that could be better. Right. You know, and, and that's the thing that I think people really just have to have that perspective. And it's so sad because the younger someone is, the less perspective they have, of course. And you see all this, like you talked about the suicides and especially the teenage suicides. It's just yeah. tragic. It really is. Yeah. I think you point to something, though, that I, I'd like to share with everybody, because I think we all have mentors. But my dad was a great mentor. He died a couple of years ago, but I uh, had a full life, 92 years old. And uh, I was in pre-med and my dad was a doctor. And I remember one day my dad said, you know, I can't pay out of state tuition for a 1.4 GPA. So we need to have a conversation when you come home for Christmas. And I remember coming home and we were in the driveway and my dad looked at me and, and my dad said, you don't have to be a doctor. I don't think you're going to be a good doctor, but I'll tell you what you are good at. You're good at business. And I think you should go into business school and it changed everything. But what was magical about that is my dad graduated from Stanford. He had a degree in psychology and a minor in accounting, and he became an accountant for one of the large energy companies. And he decided at the age of 30 that he wasn't fulfilled. He wasn't joyful. You know, he, he could do the numbers well, but every day he was, he had a bad attitude about what he was doing. And so he he decided at age 30 to become a physician and it took him 10 years 
And at the age of 40, he joined a medical practice in Long Beach, California, because he didn't want to spend his whole life doing what he was unhappy doing. And with all the, you know, the test scores and the the degrees and the Stanford backing, you know, my dad said, I'm going to Cincinnati. I'm going to medical school. Uh, I'll do accounting for 10 years, but I'm going to become a doctor come hell or high water. And my dad from age 40 to 65 was full of joy because he got to follow his passion. And it was just amazing that the last five years, the partnership paid him more money than he would have made in an entire career being a CPA, but he wasn't going for the money. He was going for the joy and happiness and fulfillment. And he ended up getting both. Yeah. Yeah. Never forget stuff. that because people yeah. just go, really? He changed careers at the age of 30. Yeah. Not only did he change, but it took him 10 years before he could make any money doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, great. So. Well, Todd, I, I could definitely talk to you for a lot longer, uh, you know. but just wrap it up for us with whatever you want the listeners to know. Yeah. I, and there a couple of things come to mind. Um, you know, fear is a good thing. People oftentimes think that fear is negative and, you know, false uh, expectations appearing real. We kind of project onto things that might happen and go wrong that really never really happen. And I was talking to some people yesterday. I said, why don't we just change our definition of fear? I mean, if, as an acronym, why can't fear just stands for standing for feel excited and ready, you know, and there's goodness that comes out of everything difficult, you know, every change that gets thrown upon us, if we have the right attitude, we can find the goodness in it. We had to pivot an event business when COVID came out and we usually had 3000 people attend this event. And after pivoting to digital, we had 44,000 people attend the event worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, there's good in everything. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, find the good in everything and, you know, keep your, keep your eyes on the horizon and and take the next step and realize that every step, you know, leads you closer to your journey. And uh, your journey is a, you know, a, a thousand miles of steps, a million miles of steps, but you can keep going forward and keep your eye on the prize. And um, God's got big things for all of us. You know, the future's big and we're in a beautiful world, even though it's full of chaos and uh, difficulty right now, but we can even choose to ignore that. I had somebody tell me yesterday, they chose not to watch the news for a month and their blood pressure went down 29 points. That was a pretty good choice. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I could talk to you forever too, Jason. This has been really engaging. I've really enjoyed our combo. Well, thank you. Feelings mutual. Todd, give out your website. Yeah, toddduncan.com. And uh, if you uh, go straight down and scroll a little bit, there's a a free download called the High Trust Interview. And it's a good way for you to kind of see what we teach in High Trust. And there's a couple of the free resources there. So toddduncan.com. And you can follow me on Todd Duncan Official, which is all my social. Good stuff. Todd Duncan, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jason. All the best, man. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.